Hello, my name is Glenn, and today is August 27th, 2023. This video is called God's Word of Patient Endurance. God's Word of Patient Endurance. God's Present Word of Patient Endurance. Do you feel safe right now? They felt safe in Maui a few weeks ago. Do you live close to any of the numerous forest fires happening in Canada, the United States, and around the world? Do you feel safe right now? Do you understand that this can happen anywhere, anytime. We have no, we have no natural defense, no natural defenses. You have to understand that there is no political solution for what's happening right now. I've taught a lot about what is going on. And I want to reaffirm that and give you a now word from the Lord. This is not easy for anyone. And I'm going to take you to scriptures now that will show you exactly what I mean. Revelation chapter 2 no, chapter 3. Um, Jesus speaks to three churches in chapter 3. The church of Sardis, the church of Philadelphia, and the church in Laodicea. To the church in Sardis, Jesus says this, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You have the reputation of being alive but you are dead. Well, it seems to me that could be speaking about the many charismatic churches that are all talking about spiritual things and prophecies and decrees in heaven and things like that, who think that they really are alive, but they are speaking from demonic spirits. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Remember what you received and heard. Remember the Holy Scriptures. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. This is a now warning. We are at that time in history when Jesus is coming like a thief. Many of these people that are in these churches, these charismatic churches especially, believe that there's going to be a great end time revival and just millions around the world are going to be saved. That doesn't happen before the coming of Christ. Jesus specifically warns us not to go running after false prophets, false apostles, and false Christ at the time just before he comes again. Then to the church in Laodicea. I'm going to skip Philadelphia right now. So to the church in Laodicea, he says this, I know your works. Well, that's how he started with the church in Sardis. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you're lurk, you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you or I will vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, I think this speaks to 
a whole lot of other churches that do not walk in charismatic gifts. They, they don't uh, walk expecting to hear prophecy or hear the Holy Spirit actually do something in the now. But they are rich. There are many rich churches that are not charismatic. But they're lukewarm. Neither cold nor hot. And then now let's look at the church in Philadelphia in chapter 3. Verse 8. I know your works. God knows all of our works. The question is, are our works born by the Holy Spirit or are our works born of our flesh? That's the key. Do we engage in dead works born of the flesh or do we only do what we see our Father doing? Do we wait and listen for the Holy Spirit to lead us in our works? I know your works, Philadelphia. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. And I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Well, I don't know about you, but I know this certainly speaks of me. I have but little power. I say I have no power. I can't lay hands on someone and see them immediately healed. I can't say a prayer and, and know that I'm going to see that prayer immediately answered. It's as if I walk in a way that's totally devoid of seeing the power of the Holy Spirit. But yet I know that the Holy Spirit dwells in me and I know He also speaks through me as I speak the Word of God. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. We are in unprecedented times. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Who's he talking about? You think he's talking about uh, the Jews, the Judaistic Jews that still congregate in their synagogues? No, because a true Jew, the scripture teaches us, is a Christian someone who sees Jesus as their king. And there are many of those who are in the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, who say they are Christians, but Jesus says they are in the synagogue of Satan. Why? What's, what's the deal here? Because they say things are of the Holy Spirit when they are not. They say things, they say the Holy Spirit is doing this when it's being done by the spirit of Satan. And then today I want to focus though on verse 10 of chapter 3 of Revelation. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Now have we been in this hour of trial for the entire 2,000 years since Christ lived and died and was resurrected? No. This speaks of one time in history the great tribulation, the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world. Then verse 11, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. These people he's talking to in Philadelphia, 
have the crown of life. They are overcomers, but their crown can still be seized. If we lose our confidence, we, if we lose our hope, our crown can be seized. So today I'm talking about this word of patient endurance, this word of God of patient endurance. What is it? In Matthew 24, Jesus tells us quite a bit about things that are going to be happening, that are happening, literally happening in these days. He begins in chapter 24 and uh, verse 3, and then in verse 8 he says, all these things that he talks about, uh, kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, famines, earthquakes, he said, all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then verse 9 says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Why? Well, who wants to be killed? Do you want to be killed? Do you want to be martyred? Who wants that? Nobody wants it. It's hard. So many fall away. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Well, lawlessness has increased to an unendurable frequency. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus says, endure to the end. Now let's go to uh, Isaiah chapter 13. The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. An oracle, oracle concerning Babylon. Could this possibly be relevant? What could Babylon have to do with what's going on today? What could it have to do with today? On a bare hill, raise a signal. Cry aloud to them. Wave the hand for them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger, my proudly exulting ones. The sound of a tumult, tumult is on the mountains as of a great multitude. The sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations, gathering together. I am of hosts is mustering a host for battle. They come from a distant land, from the end of the heavens. I am and the weapons of his in indignation to destroy the whole land. Wail, wail for the day of I am is near. You know, in the Old Testament, the prophets asked, why do you want the day of I am? Wail, for the day of I am is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble, and every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed, pangs, and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of I am comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant. I will lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I will make people more rare than fine gold and mankind more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of I am of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. 
And like a hunted gazelle, or like sheep with none to gather them, each will turn to his own people, and each will flee to his own land. Whoever is found will be thrust through, and whoever is caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed in pieces before their eyes, their houses will be plundered, and their wives raped. Behold, I am stirring up the Medes against them, who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold against them, against Babylon, against the Chaldeans. Their bows will slaughter the young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. You know, there have been people who've written books about how this supposedly took place 2,600 years ago when Medea Persia conquered Babylon. But it didn't, it was not fulfilled then because that area was always populated and there were people there. In fact, that's where Saddam Hussein lived and was destroyed not too many years ago. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. For all generations. But it has been, has it? No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. But wild animals will lie down there and their houses will be full of howling creatures. Its time is close at hand and its days will not be prolonged. This is a prophetic scripture still. It's speaking about the coming destruction of Babylon the Great. Well, what about that? Revelation chapter 17. In Revelation chapter 17, God introduces the woman. And I'll just read the first six verses here. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. Now, Babylon the Great. Well, let me continue reading through six. He carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. Her golden cup filled with the impurities of her sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery. On her forehead, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. Babylon the Great, she is the mother of prostitutes and of the earth's abominations. She is the mother of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Who is the woman? She's pretty much everything that we have seen in control of every nation in the earth. She, of course, it includes and is epitomized by the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church is the mother of the prostitutes, the prostitutes being the Protestant churches that came out of the Catholic Church. And so, but it's not limited to Christian immorality and Christian harlotry.
In the very end of verse 6, when John saw her, he says, I marveled greatly. I was astonished. Why was he astonished? Because he saw the end result of what he began. He knew it was the church, but it's not only the church. So I have to be careful here because I'm not saying that it's the Catholic Church. I'm not saying that it's a certain Protestant church. I'm not saying it's a particular government on the earth or a particular nation in the earth. The fact is, Babylon the Great rules all the nations of the earth and with religious fervor. All nations have their pet religions. And those, the religion and the political, the religious leaders and the political leaders are always in bed together. They're the ones who make the decisions in meetings. Oh, and let's not forget secret societies, of course. All the secret societies, um, and you know who they are, all of them are included here as well. Because many, many Christians are also members of the secret societies. Like Freemasons, of course. But why would that be? Why, why would a Christian be involved in a secret society? So, John marvels, the angel asks, why did you marvel? But then the angel says, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. Now this beast with seven heads represents the governments, the political governments that have ruled the world throughout this entire uh through the ages after the flood, up through the time of Christ, and now up through our time. He introduces this beast, and then he says this with respect to the beast, that the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. So seven heads, seven rulers, seven mountains, seven distinct uh, names of empire, like Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Holy Roman Empire. Then he says, there are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the one that was then is Rome. The other is not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. That was what Rome developed into, the Holy Roman Empire that became, well, is known here as Babylon the Great. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth. But it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. In other words, this beast is one of the previous seven. I believe that it's the principality, the, the demonic principality that ruled in the Persian kingdom, the one that came right after Babylon. And that this eighth head of the beast is now alive. He is empowered by this spiritual principality. And listen to what God says concerning this. So the beast that was and is not is an eighth. It belongs to the seven and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power. But they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. These are of one mind, 
and they will hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he, the Lamb, is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw, where the prostitute is seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. The ten horns, ten kings, I don't think it's a specific number. I think it is the complete number of kings, of nations, that are going to support the eighth head of the beast. And I think they are already now supporting that eighth head of the beast. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. Who's the prostitute? Babylon the Great. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. See, the great city, Babylon the Great, has always had dominion over the kings of the earth. With the, the secret societies, the religion that always props up the kingdom, the decisions that are made in secret and then implemented by those who know in order to continue propping up Babylon the Great. They have controlled the kings of the earth. But the time now has come where God has put it into the heart of the beast, the eighth head of the beast, and the kings of the earth who have given themselves to this beast to destroy Babylon the Great. Haven't you thought it rather strange how we're witnessing the systematic destruction of society. Every society, every nation. Some things start first in Ireland. Some things start first in Germany. Some things start first in Australia. Some things start first in Canada. Sometimes England. The United States. Edicts, the leaders saying, we can't have gas stoves anymore in our houses. Can't use, can't use gasoline. You know, can't use natural gas or propane in our houses anymore. Politicians who say we have to have uh, all of our vehicles running on uh, electricity instead of gasoline. Our politicians who say, we've got to close down our electrical power plants that burn coal. The politicians tell the farmers, the ranchers, that you can't raise cattle because the cattle uh, fart and release methane into the atmosphere. The politicians tell the farmers, you can't use fertilizer to grow your food, you know. In Denmark, the government tells 30,000 farmers to shut down. What is this? Oh, not to mention the 200 plus food processing plants in the United States alone that have been destroyed over the last two years. Or the countless railroad accidents spilling tox toxic wastes into our streams, into our air, or the countless fires that we have everywhere in the earth spewing all this into the air. But it's the cattle. It's the cattle and it's our gas uh, appliances. 
that are really causing the problem. Um, and I haven't mentioned the weather modification constantly. It's everything, all of the weather is constantly controlled all the time. Chemtrails are real. If you just take time to look up in the sky, you will discern it. So, didn't you think it's strange that we're seeing all of this infrastructure of society around the world being systematically destroyed. Didn't that seem strange to you? Or have you wrapped your mind around it yet? Do you think, you know, it, it amazes me how many people I see still going on vacations. How can you go on a vacation in a world that is in this much chaos? How can you entrust yourself to agents who ridicule you and embarrass you to get on a, an American airplane when you've been an American all your life. How can you bear it? When you understand that God put it into the heart of the final head of the final beast kingdom and the kings that associate with him, that God put it into their hearts to destroy this whole system that we live in. When you finally wrap your mind around that, then you understand that this is it. It's not going back to normal. It's never going back to normal because Babylon is going to cease to exist. And that's what Isaiah was talking about in chapter 13. At the end of that prophecy, speaking of Babylon, 19 and 20, chapter 13, 19 and 20, Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. What was Sodom and Gomorrah like? Utterly destroyed. Didn't exist. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. Okay. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 18 this time because we just finished reading what God puts, it into, the, puts into the heart of the beast. And then chapter 18 of Revelation starts. After this... I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become the dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations, all nations, have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. All nations have become immoral. One nation thinks of some abominable, abominable sexual thing to do, and then the other nations follow suit. And the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Now listen, if you haven't seen this before now, then listen. Revelation 18.4 says this, Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her plagues, lest you share in her plagues, lest you take part in her sins, for her sins are heaped high as heaven. So this is one of the last calls you're going to be hearing. Come out of her, my people. If you're still going on vacations, if you're still doing everything that the medical establishment says to do, if you are not thinking for yourself in light of God's word,
if you are not thinking for yourself, you won't come out of her. If you understand what's going on, you will come out of Babylon. Because what is about to happen? Verse 8. Because she glorified herself and lived in luxury, because of her sins, verse 8, for this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her, and the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. In a single hour. Brothers, sisters, we are at that hour. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, Jesus says to the Philadelphian church, Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. What hour is that? That's this hour that we see in Revelation chapter 18, verse 10, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses, and chariots, and slaves, that is, human souls. Now, we have learned a lot about human trafficking, sex trafficking, the, the enslavement of human souls lately. That's what Babylon, Babylon trades in, and all of these things. The fruit for which your soul longed is gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares, who gained wealth from her, will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels, and with pearls. For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. If you stay in Babylon, all of your wealth will be laid waste. At the minimum. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and all those whose trade is on the sea, stood far off and cried out, as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like this great city? And they threw dust on their heads. See, all the people who are into the trading, into the, the huge ships and into the businesses, they were all made rich by Babylon. They threw dust on their heads and they wept and mourned because they, they see their, their thing is over. Alas, alas for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew by her wealth, grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour, that's the third time now it said hour, in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heavens, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. We are to rejoice that Babylon the Great is coming down. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and 
Rejoice, you saints, you Kodeshim, you apostles, you prophet, prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Don't get involved in, it, in any patriot movement. Don't get involved in any uh, gun rights movements. This is so much bigger than our rights. And it's way beyond anything political. You who are still doing things according to politics are deceived because nothing gets done in the light of day, which is what you see the politicians doing at Congress and state houses around the nation. All of the decisions that affect us are done in secret by those who are in power secretly and then give their edicts to those who we see then on TV or other places. Don't get caught up in those movements, especially with what is about to happen with respect to the 2024 election. Don't be deceived. There's going to be a whole lot of false prophets, false apostles, telling you they've had dreams, they've had words from God, they've had angelic visitations. Don't believe them. Jesus said, don't believe them. When you see these things happening that I'm telling you about and that you see, when you see these things, don't believe the false prophets. Here's what Jesus said in chapter 24 of Matthew. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. See, we see that the mark of the beast is here. It has been introduced with the uh, forced jab, and it's going to get a lot worse very soon. When you see this, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Those in Judea are true Jews, those who believe in Jesus Christ, and they flee to the mountains that God raises up. God is going to raise up mountains of protection for his people. And so begin looking for mountains to flee to. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. In other words, those of you who are busy with, with your agenda, with your works, those of you who are busy with your ministries, your little babies, those of you who are still nursing your baby ministries, when you see this, don't go back to business as usual. Tell them, if you have a ministry, tell them, it's time to get out of Babylon. It's time to leave Babylon. Verse 21, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. This great tribulation is the hour of trial coming upon the earth. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then, so then at this time we're coming into concerning the destruction of Babylon the Great, seeing that it is at hand. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So there will be people who even dare to say that they are the Christ. 
See, I've told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness. Christ is in the wilderness. Do not go out. If they say, look, Christ is in the inner rooms. Do not go. Do not believe it. If they say, oh, Christ is really working at these revivals. Do you get it? You know, bring it back home. Don't go out there running looking for Christ. The kingdom of God is within you. The Holy Spirit lives within you. And we are to follow the Holy Spirit within us. Don't be deceived by deceivers who tell you they hear from God when they don't. And then he ends this little section saying this. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. In other words, wherever death is, wherever false Christs are, false prophets, false apostles, wherever they are, wherever the corpse is, wherever death is, there the vultures, those who eat death, will gather. Don't be of those who eat death, but be of those who eat life, the living word of Christ. And so in Revelation, back to Revelation 18, Verse 20, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against Babylon the Great. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the Great City be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants, your Canaanites, your traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-S, your merchants were the great ones of the earth, Babylon's merchants, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery, your pharmacaea. And in her, in Babylon the Great, was found the blood of prophets and of saints. Saints are the Kodeshim, the holy ones, and of all who have been slain on the earth. Everyone in the history of the earth has been slain by a citizen of Babylon the Great. All the way back to Cain. And why did he kill his brother? Because his sacrifice was not acceptable to God. So it was a, re a religious reason. Do you know how many bloody wars have been fought for religious reasons. Do you think Jesus would have fought in any of those wars? What did Jesus say? Love your enemy. Do good to those who persecute you. Did Jesus stand up for his rights? Did he go to court to enforce his rights. Now, in this last section of Revelation chapter 18, all these things that you will never ever see or hear in Babylon again, like harps, musicians, um, craftsmen, bridegroom, bride, so no more marriages. <clears throat> Does this mean that these things are never going to happen on the earth again? Of course not. What it means is these things will never happen in Babylon the Great again. And why not? Because Babylon the Great is going to be utterly and completely destroyed. 
That destruction is shown in Daniel chapter 2 by the rock that is thrown upon the toes of the great statue. That's the destruction of Babylon the Great, and it comes, God is using the members of Babylon the Great and those who now have turned against her. You know, it's amazing, these, the, the eighth head of the beast, the mortal eighth head, and the um, kings of the earth, the mortal kings of the earth who are with him, um, they all became rich and famous because of Babylon the Great. And they are the ones now actively destroying Babylon the Great. Isn't that interesting? So see, it's God's judgment. But it's hard to endure through this judgment. God's word of endurance. Because, see, we've been affected. We have been affected by what has happened in the world. We're affected by these disasters that happen everywhere. We were uh, all affected by the pandemic. Some of us were seriously hurt by whatever that COVID-19 is. And because God didn't protect us from injury, health injury, It can become very frustrating, and I'm sure there's many of you who can relate to this. We have to endure through pain and suffering toward our destination. And I want to take you to the scripture dealing with that. Very powerful. This is in Hebrews uh, I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 11 and 12. In Hebrews 11, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. And then it goes through many other uh, men of faith, Enoch, Abraham, Moses, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, prophets. Uh, verse 35 in chapter 11 of Hebrews says, Women received back their dead by resurrection. Well, I don't know of any stories about that, that, but that would be interesting. Some were tortured, tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. In other words, those who come to faith later. Because God's plan has been to bring about revelation of who he is through the ages and the Old Testament age of the Israel being one of those ages. Then verse 12 begins, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight 
and lay aside every sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance, run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. So, this chapter just began, and endurance is already mentioned three times in three verses. Now listen to verse 4. After enduring, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Have you? No. We're still alive, aren't we? So in our struggle against sin, we have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Yeah, you've taken some blows, some hits, but do you keep getting up and standing for the truth? Verse 5. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Nor be weary, weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. That's the fourth time now. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. That we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Trained by the discipline. Trained by the pain. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. One of the great missing teachings today is holiness, that we are to be holy as he is holy. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. See to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or unholy, like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So, for some things, you see, you can lose an inheritance by selling your birthright, by not continuing to walk in God's discipline and, and repentance for our sins. So, he gives us the story of Esau, and then he says this, very profound. This is uh, verse 18. Hebrews 12. For you have not come to what may be touched. You have not come to what may be touched. You haven't come to a blazing fire and a darkness and a gloom and a tempest. And you haven't come to the sound of the trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. So we haven't come to something in the natural. We have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God 
the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable, innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. The word assembly is ecclesia, the word church, that we get the word church from. So to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all. That's where we have come. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is where we have come, in the spirit, to these things. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, that's the people back at the time of Moses, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Right now, you know, we, we have to continue in faith. We, we will not escape if we reject him. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. So he is shaking our earth. He's shaking Babylon the Great. But he also is going to shake the heavens. And this phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. And we have come to New Jerusalem, not to Old Jerusalem. This is not in the natural. We do not do things in the natural. We do not do things according to the flesh. We do things by the Spirit of God as we are led by the Spirit of God. If we sin, we acknowledge our sin, we repent of our sin, we get up from our sin, and we walk on with Jesus. And we'll do that until the end. Until we either die in this flesh, or until... we are glorified and made immortal. And I want to finish this with a short passage at the end of Isaiah 26 because this is where we are. Isaiah, Isaiah 26, verses 20 and 21. Come, my people, enter your chambers, and shut your doors behind you. Hide. Hide yourselves for a little while until the fury has passed. For behold, I am is coming out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their sin. And the earth will disclose the blood shed on it and will no more cover its slain. Come, my people, come out of Babylon and enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Shut your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the fury has passed by. Of course it's sad to see the destruction of everything we know. Of course we feel bad for our family and our friends. We don't see 
who somehow can't see me. But come, my people, enter your chambers. Shut your doors behind you. Can you imagine Noah? Would he shut the door? Would God shut the door? Noah and his wife had no friend in the ark with them. No niece, no nephew, no aunt, no uncle, no mother, no father. Only three children and their wives. They had to go into the ark. They had to enter their chamber. And God shut the door. This is God's doing. We can't fix it. The scripture says we would have healed Babylon. We, that's a prophetic word from God's people. We would have healed Babylon, but she would not be healed. The time for politics is over. The time for patriots is over. Enter your chambers. Shut your doors.